everyone. Welcome back. We're going to be focusing on Egypt, the Hittites, and the Nubian Kingdom of Moreau. We're going to start with the Old and Middle Kingdoms of Egypt, circa 3100 to 1500 BCE. Before I dive into the history, let's talk geography for a minute. If you look at the map of Egypt, traditionally, Egypt has been divided into three regions. We have Lower Egypt, where the Nile empties into the Mediterranean Sea. We have Upper Egypt, right around here. And then we have Nubia or Kush, which Egypt has a very interesting dynamic with Nubia. Sometimes they're trading, trading partners, sometimes they're allies, and sometimes one of them is ruling over the other. In addition, Egypt has been both protected and isolated by its natural barriers. So three sides are desert, and then the fourth is the Mediterranean. And this did allow Egypt to interact with the rest of the continent of Africa. It did, however, isolate them from really any region beyond Syria, Palestine, um, they will be taken over by Rome, as I'm sure you already know, just across the Mediterranean, but we're about 3,000 years early for that. So what is a cataract? You may have heard the phrase cataracts of the Nile, and there are six of them, and there are shallow lengths of water in the Nile where the surface is broken by small boulders popping up from the riverbed. If you ever heard the phrase white water rapids, this is it. However, I would not advise people to actually whitewater raft themselves down the Nile. There's there's crocodiles and you know things that enjoy eating you. Just throwing that out there. Egypt only has one cataract, though. The rest are in modern day Sudan. Egypt has been called the gift of the Nile. For one main reason, the Nile floods on a predictable basis. And because it floods at the right time every year, it allowed the Egyptians to think of the world as a, as a fair and harmonious place where good things happened and candy popped out of the ground like a daisy. Not really. But the Nile did flood at the perfect time of year that would allow barley and wheat to grow. And this belief that the universe was a good, peaceful place carried over, and Egyptians believed that the afterlife was also peaceful, as opposed to the Mesopotamians, who believed that the afterlife was a sad, depressing waste pit. Egypt's other natural resources also included reeds, wild animals, birds and fish, and they had plenty of stone and clay. You, you've seen the pyramids. As well as access to copper and turquoise in the desert, and Egyptians loved gold. The pharaohs loved gold. You guys know who Cleopatra is? Yeah. Her, uh, her pet leopard actually had multiple gold collars with precious jewels in them, depending on what day of the week it was. But Egypt didn't have gold, so they would actually have to get that from Nubia. And Egypt and Nubia had a very interesting dynamic. Sometimes they were trading partners, sometimes they were allies, and other times... Egypt conquered Nubia or Nubia conquered Egypt. Let's talk Egyptian society, shall we? Ancient Egypt had about 1 to 1.5 million people. And by 3100 BCE, hieroglyphics had developed. By 2500 BCE, a second writing system called Hieratic will develop, but that's actually only for priests. Egypt was also unified anywhere between 3500 and 3200 BCE. And legend states that when the two kingdoms of Thebes and Memphis became united, that was the start of Old Egypt. Egypt is also divided into several different social classes. So obviously first is the king. And Below the king, you have high-ranking officials and the priests, but we'll just group them into one. And then you have your lower-level officials, and then your local leaders, and local priests, and professionals, and artisans, and well-off farmers, and then everybody else. The peasants and the majority of the population, and then slaves would actually fall into a fourth category. The Egyptians were great at bureaucracy, and we're going to talk a lot more about that later, but... There's a tax code and a paper for everything. Peasants lived in villages and they would cultivate the soil, 
grow crops, and they're responsible for paying taxes as well as providing labor services. And you can't see my hands right now, but I'm doing that little air quote thing. Uh, providing labor services, it's forced labor. They're not slaves, but it's it's kind of like paying your taxes, except you have to work for free. Paintings indicate that women were subordinate to men and they generally engaged in domestic activities. However, this is very important, folks. Egyptian women had the right to hold, inherit, and will property. They also retained rights over their own dowry after a divorce. They probably had more rights than Mesopotamian women, especially in terms when it, when it came to property, not just hold it or inherit it, but they can then will it to whoever they want to. Most societies, when a woman marries, all of her property becomes her husband's. And if her husband dies, she doesn't get that back. Her sons get it. And then her fate is left in her son's hands. The Pharaoh of Egypt was considered to be God in human form. Um, unlike Mesopotamia, where the king was sort of the middleman between gods and people, the pharaoh was actually seen as a god come to earth to ensure the welfare and prosperity of all the people. And because of that, they were often worshipped. And in the capital, the pharaoh presided over rituals to the gods. And in the rest of Egypt, priests performed these rituals for the pharaoh. And not just the Pharaoh, but their families were also considered to be semi-divine. And the only person who saw the Pharaoh outside of the family was called a grand vizier or just a vizier. He's the Pharaoh's chief advisor and handles most of the state affairs. And he's assisted by high and low ranking officials. And I told you guys that Egypt's, uh, ancient Egyptians were experts at bureaucracy, the Egyptian government had so many levels. Egypt was actually broken up into 40 districts ruled by governors. And at all levels, the Egyptian government relied heavily on professional scribes. Bureaucrats would keep track of land, labor, and taxes, as well as the people. And then they would collect resources throughout the, the country be it taxes or crops or keeping track of owed labor, and then use this to actually build monuments, build, I mean, guys, those, those pyramids cost money. Come on now. But it would be used, it would be put back into the, into the country. Now, mind you, these peasants aren't benefiting from the pyramids, but the belief is that it benefits the king and thus it benefits all of us. Being a scribe was a pull to social mobility, hence the text, to be a scribe, um, the advice, become a scribe. And what's very important is that the pharaoh owned all of the land. And because he owned all of the land, farmers owed a part of their crops to him. Communication and trade. So ancient Egyptians had two writing systems, hieroglyphics, and then a scribe-only cursive script called Hadratic, about 2500 BCE is when that showed up. And Egyptian writing was used to document both religious and secular literature, as well as record keeping. Now, what's really interesting is the Egyptian population was very diverse. But if you were a native Egyptian, then you were regarded as an enemy and dangerous. And the desert kept Egypt safe from any serious military threat. Egypt was generally more interested in acquiring resources than territory, and that's why they often chose the method of trade, except when it came to Nubia. Uh, they did trade with Nubia, but later on, they're actually going to rule over Nubia because they want the gold. Items of trade included exports of grain, um, and gold they got from Nubia, which is actually kind of funny. And then they would import more gold from Nubia, um, as well as incense, cedar, and tropical African ivory, ebony, and animals. Again, Cleopatra had a pet leopard. Leopards aren't exactly native to the desert. And this is just a map of the various trading routes that Egypt had. You can see all of the various locations they're trading with. 
All right. When anyone thinks of Egypt, generally the first thing they think of are either pyramids or mummies. Egyptian mythology, in terms of their gods and goddesses, we know that Egyptians were a polytheistic culture. Um, the most important god was the sun god, Re. Um, later, he'll become Ra or Amun-Ra, as well as Osiris, who was the god of the underworld. And when he was killed and, and dismembered, he was restored to life. He was put back together. And this represents the renewal and life after death. And tombs contain pictures and samples of food, other necessities that give us a lot of great information about daily life in Egypt. But it also tells us that the Egyptians believe people would need these tools and these items in the afterlife. And the ancient Egyptians were brilliant when it came to medicine and anatomy because of mummification. And aside from that, other scientific advances and technological advances, math, astronomy, uh, calendar making, irrigation, engineering, and architecture, again, the pyramids, and transportation technology. Um, one of the, the lighthouse of Alexandria, um, it's no longer there, but it did allow study of time. It allowed study of astronomy. Moving on to the afterlife. Watching my friend Cleo, Cleopatra. That is actually Cleopatra, guys. Um, her body is lying in a museum in London, England. Early pharaohs were buried in flat-topped rectangular tombs. Nothing special. Later on, um, a stepped pyramid would appear. And later on, the smooth-sided famous pyramids uh, would begin being constructed. The Great Pyramids of Giza were built between um 2550 and 2490 bce and these great pyramids were constructed with stone tools and a simple simple lever and pulley method as well as roller technology and obviously you need a lot of manpower for this royalty were mummified so they could preserve the body which would allow the ka which was their belief in an energy a spirit a life force to survive you preserve the body you preserve the ka and this actually, uh, ancient Egyptians never burned their dead. They always buried them or entombed them, which is interesting because in the Jewish faith, you cannot cremate a body. It has to be buried in the ground. And a number of cultures or religions share this belief that it's, it's almost sacrilege to burn a body and you destroy the energy if you destroy the body. These are the Giza pyramids for Khufu and Khafre, and these are the most famous pyramids in Egypt. And guys, it took about 20,000 people to build one of these. And these are smaller pyramids, probably for the wives. Oh, burial. So this poor schmuck, I mean, guys, he was just thrown to the ground with some pots. Have a nice day. But the sand was so hot and so dry, it's, it naturally mummified him. It's one of those sad, flat roof pyramids. And here you have the somewhat more impressive step pyramid. All right, so here's just some very 2D art. And one thing I, I do like about Egyptian art is it's very simple, it's very basic, but it allows historians to really analyze values in Egyptian society. And this one that just popped up, it's my favorite because it's a great representation of class structure in Egypt. Now, this drawing is clearly not to scale. This guy is not 20 feet tall. That woman is not two feet high. So clearly what we have here is a higher male figure and a woman in front of him, if you look at her, obviously she's smaller, but she's still very well-dressed. She seems to be fanning him. She could be um, a, a wife, probably not the first wife, but she's too well-dressed to be a servant. So I'd probably say she's either one of the wives or perhaps the concubine. Now, the woman at his feet who is massaging his calves She's not wearing any jewelry, and given the fact that she's so small, she's probably just a servant. But again, size to show class. That's pretty cool. 
All right, so a couple more examples of Egyptian art. So here we have Anubis weighing a heart. And hearts on one side, feathers on the other. And if the feather is heavier than the heart, then the, um, the, the ka, if you will, is thrown into a lake of fire forever. But if the heart is heavier, because the heart has done many good deeds, they get to go to the, un the underworld. So this is me in the same museum where Cleopatra is. And this is a sarcophagus. Again, same museum. Check it out. All right. So mummification, we preserve the body. And that's how the Egyptians figured out so much about anatomy. Um, the earliest example of a mummy is about 2400 BCE. All right. So moving on into the New Kingdom. The New Kingdom was preceded by the decline of the Middle Kingdom and the non-Egyptian Hyksus. This is the first time non-Egyptians are ruling over Egypt. And they um, they did not rule for very long. A native Egyptian dynasty overthrew the Hyksus and started the 18th Dynasty. And the 18th Dynasty is characterized by a very aggressive expansion into the Syria-Palestine region, but also into the Nubian region because Egypt needed gold from Nubia. And this is where you're going to see a lot of changes starting in Egypt. Starting in Egypt you have worship of the sun god Amun-Ra above any other god. And he's characterized by a disc uh, above his head to represent the sun. And after conquering Nubia, pharaohs attempted to make it more Egyptian. They brought the sons of Nubian chiefs into Egypt, taught them all the customs and the language, and then those sons brought Egyptian culture back to Nubia. In addition, we also have uh, a, a radical thing happening. We have a queen, Queen Hashepsut. She's the only woman pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, and she reigned from 1473 to 1458 BCE. Now, other royal women had served as regents, also called the great royal wife. Hashepsut ruled as a pharaoh, and she would actually often present herself dressed as a man, probably to really try and solidify her power. She added to the temple of Karnak, and then she also built a new temple in the Valley of the Kings. You'll see that on the next slide. And then Akhenaten. So Akhenaten reigned from 1352 to 1336 BCE and completely changed Egyptian religion. No more Munra. Now it's Aten, a different sun god. And Akhenaten is also really forceful in let's only worship Aten. And after his death, Egyptians would again begin worshiping Amun-Ra as the most important god. And Akhenaten viewed other kings as equal or subservient. And he also increased the access to gold from Nubia. And, and Akhenaten dies, and then his son actually takes the throne. But then the 19th dynasty, uh, most famous is King Ramses II, um, renewed the policy of conquest and expansion, and they rule... Um, they rule for a very long time. Ramses II, also known as Ramses the Great, is one of the most famous pharaohs Egypt ever had. Now, Queen Ashepsu, this is the temple that she created. It's very, well, so she ordered it to be built. She didn't actually create it. King Akhenaten is very famous, not just because of the whole Aten sun god thing. He's the father of King Tut. All right, so Egypt and Nubia. Nubia is located in the Nile Valley. Um, it forms a link between tropical Africa and the Mediterranean world. And Nubia has a great deal of gold that, as you've already heard, the Egyptians just couldn't keep their hands off of. So the development of civilization in Nubia was spurred by the need for more agriculture and its trading relationship with Egypt. And Nubian culture and Egyptian culture develop through mutual influence and borrowing. And Egypt actually lost control of Nubia after 1293 BCE. 
And the Nubian state would centralize around 800 BCE. And in 747, King Paye of Nubia conquered Egypt. And this is the second time that Egypt was ruling, being ruled by somebody who was not Egyptian. And trade would continue between the two. Um, but Nubia, um, the Nubians adopted quite a bit of Egyptian culture. And this occurred after Egypt uh, invaded Nubia once again. When the um, Nubia began ruling Egypt, they created the 25th dynasty. And this was a very short-lived dynasty, but it was often called the Kingdom of Moreau. And the Nubian kingdom had its capital at Napata from, six, um, from 660 BCE to the 4th century. And in the 4th century, the kingdom moved its capital to Moreau because it was better located for agriculture and trade. And... During this time, um, the Kingdom of Moreau practiced a matrilineal family system, which is actually pretty awesome. And how it worked is the title of king, when a king died, that title would not go to his son. It would go to his sister's son. And if the nephew was a child, the mother would rule for him. And Nubian queens had all the power of Nubian kings. And the reason they did this, the reason that the title would pass to the king's sister's son, was so they could guarantee that it was a continuation of the bloodline. Because I, I guess they believe that, you know, this, this child that my wife had might not actually be mine. It's a little depressing, but whatever. Moreau eventually declined due to a shift in trade routes, the rise of the Kingdom of Aksum, and attacks from camel-riding nomads. All right. So we're going to wrap up in just a minute, talk about the Hittites for a second. They ruled uh, from 2000 to 1200 BCE, and their capital is in Anatolia. And I know this is kind of a stretch, like we were just talking about Egypt, and now we're talking about Anatolia, which is modern-day Turkey. But the reason I wanted to bring them up is because the Hittites are the first ones to actually develop an empire based on iron. And they're the first ones who are able to discover how to make iron. They can keep that knowledge secret for about 200 years, and then it, then it spreads. Like, you can't hide that. But why I brought them up is because the Hittites actually developed a new mode of transportation. Um, it's a new type of chariot. It's a two-horse chariot, two warriors, one driver. And at the Battle of Kadesh, this chariot is introduced in Egypt. <clears throat> and you should know, it's a draw. No one wins, no one loses. Um, Hittites and Egyptians call it. It is what it is. Uh, but this is how that knowledge spreads, is through this war. All right, we're going to wrap that up now. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. Otherwise, have a great day, guys. Cheers.